let's talk about interactable objects in RPG Builder. As you can imagine by their name, these are things that you place in your world and can interact with. I prepared a few of them in this kind of playground, but this is a very, very small part of what they can do. They can actually trigger hundreds, if not thousands of unique actions, actions that can be either RPG Builder related or Unity related. I'm going to show you all the options with RPG Builder, but also keep in mind that this interactable object supports Unity events. So not only you can trigger anything that a Unity event can trigger, but you can also use Unity events to trigger things in your own code, meaning that, as you can now imagine, possibilities are endless. So let's take a look at how they work. First of all, they have a few options in what way you can interact with them or interact with them or trigger them, right? The first one is, for example, clicking on them. As you can see, as I hover these buckets, it's becoming, the cursor is becoming yellow and I can then right click on it and it's going to start interacting with it. As you can see, I got some item and also, as you can see, the water is gone from the bucket. Let's do it again so we can see it better. And this is another side cool uh, feature about them. You have different appearances um, that you can set those interactable objects to have based on their states. The different available states are ready, just like it is right now. So it is ready to be interacted with. Now we have it on cooldown. The water is gone. And the third state we're not going to be covering in this video, but it is disabled. And disabled means that once you use persistence with an interactable object, it is going to be pretty much in a way on cooldown if you want to. So you can't use it, but forever, because this is now no longer possible to use for your character. But persistence is not something I'm going to be covering this video. It is going to have its own video a bit um, after that one. Anyway, let's take a look at something else. Here we have something uh, different. As you can see, um, not only we can click on them to trigger, but we can also have this kind of interaction UI. So as I'm looking at this box here, I can interact with it. This one has a different loot table and it's also looking um, broken. We can very easily trigger animations on those. So as I'm using this chest and when I'm done using it, as you can see, the chest is now open and it will close again when it is ready to be used. So pretty cool. Uh, animations can be triggered on both the interactable object and the player. So this is something I probably should have set up for this video, but in this case, it's not set up, but it is as easy as just typing the name of the uh, parameter you want to um, trigger and that's it. And the third way to interact with them is by not clicking or pressing any key is simply to walk um, in their collider. So as you collide with the collider that we set up for them, it's going to trigger. In this case, you see that the door is opening, closing on its own. And when we get um, close enough, it's going to trigger. Another nice use case for those triggers is to have, for example, traps or a buff in your world. As you can see here, as I step in uh, one of those traps, it triggers. So we also play an animation on it to make it look cool. And we take some damage. This one is also a trap. And uh, this one even has two effects on it. So we have the instant damage. As you can see here, we took some instant damage. And it also has a 25% chance to uh, apply a dot that we have right here. You see that now, even after going out of the trap, we still get damage. Here we have another cool thing. So this is a Unity event. It's a basic use case. In this case, we are disabling this rock as we uh, you know, trigger this interactable object. But as I said before, it could be any Unity event. We can very easily with RPG Builder change the time of the day and go back to night, of course, and so on. And lastly, one other use case, but again, this can trigger any effect you want, but here we could um, spawn a pet for us. So now we have our pet and we can tell him to uh, go attack the dummy targets. So he's going to attack, he's going to fight for us and so on. I'm going to dismiss him, we don't need him for now. Cool. So that was it for like the short, small presentation about what I prepared for you. but. As I said, this is a very, very, very small part of what they can actually do. And you will realize this very soon. So um, let's take a look at how these are set up in the scene. Like how do we actually create one of those? So very simple. It's obviously a game object in your scene. Keep in mind that um, 
this game object or this interactable object have no requirement uh, when it comes to being static or something. They can be static, they can be fully dynamic, they can be animated, they can be rotated, moved, whatever you want. Uh, they can be spawned as well, they don't need to be in the scene. You could, for example, make this bucket a prefab and if you wanted to spawn it, you could. Um, for things like a door extra, you can imagine that it's most likely going to be in your seed, right? But I don't know, anything, maybe a chest, maybe a shrine, anything could be um, spawned and work just as it would if it was already in the scene. Now, one of the main thing, um, or rather main components to have is a collider. I made sure that every collider type was uh, supported. So here we're using a capsule, here we're using a box, here we're using a um, sphere. And here on this uh, axe trap, I'm even using a uh, mesh collider, as you can see. So you can use whatever collider type you want. And again, let's look at the bucket. So the collider part is quite important, of course, because you need it to um, click on it or interact with as you enter the collider. Another quick note is um, if you want this UI to show, so when you see the interaction UI right this, this will only show if you assign um, your interactable layer to it. So this is not a predefined layer. You can name it whatever you want. If you go under settings, world and layers, you see here that you can select what layer you want this to be. It doesn't need to be called that way, but make sure that if you want to see this UI here, you need this layer, whatever you have assigned here on your game object. That's all. And now we can start taking a look at the actual components, so interactable objects. So as you can see, of course, I could just create a new game object and type um, inter, I mean, whatever you want, of course, but here you can see interactable objects, add the component, and that's it. I'm ready to uh, set it up. But again, let's go back to the buckets because this one is already set up. So the first section is persistence. This is what I said I'm not going to cover in this video, but I'm still going to show you what this is and why you might want this in your game. So let's uh, interact with this chest here. As you can see, it's going to open and it has a cooldown, right? But if I go outside of play mode now and go back, you can see that the chest is ready to use again. And while this might be fine for a, a lot of things that you don't really care about when whether they are on cooldown or not, for things that are important, let's say that you use an interactable object um, in RPG Builder or like in your game to give maybe one talent point of a specific talent point type, right, for your character. And this talent point should only be obtained once because it's very important in your game design. You use it to unlock very strong abilities and so on. Anyway, you get the idea. You want this to happen only once. Persistence is what allows you to do that. It basically saves the state of an interactable object. And it will basically save and not allow your character to interact with it again. Or it could be used, as I'm going to show you in the next video, to keep certain things open. So for example, I could go here, open the door, and I could keep the door open. It will not close, and when I next um, enter the game, it will still be open. But anyway, that's long enough on the... <laughs> on the um, uh, persistence part. Uh, I'm going to cover this in detail in its own video, like I said. So second section is activation. This is basically um, letting you define whether this interactable object can be interacted with a click or triggered. Keep in mind that you can have both enabled, it's completely fine. We could have, for example, the um, bucket to be also triggered. If you do turn on trigger enable here, make sure to also turn on is trigger in your collider. And if I now uh, step, uh, I can actually have to reduce the interaction time here, so it's not, you know, using a bar. But if I now step on the um, uh, bucket, you can see that it is used just like if we clicked on it. Cool. So like I said, you can have both. Um, if you have zero, it's still going to show the uh, interaction, interaction UI, and you can still use it. But in this case, let's put it back to just click. Cool. Next, we have the requirements section. So for this, I'm going to go in RPG Builder, Templates and Requirements. And here, for example, you could create a new one, let's say Shrine Requirement, whatever name you want. Requirements, uh, again, I'm not going to cover those because they are also going to have their own videos. But as you can see, you can have as many requirement groups as you want, and each group can have its own list of requirements. Requirements can be either mandatory or optional. 
and they come with a massive list of options. And not only the list itself is massive, but if we now go under item, for example, you can see that within each of those types, we have multiple options. It's not only, oh, do we have this item? In this case, it is, but it could be, do we not have it or do we have it equipped? Or we can also check other things that just item, item type, weapon slots, um, weapon type. So let's say, do we have uh, an ax equipped? This could be a requirement, right? So yeah, you get the idea. And like I said, we have a big list here. So requirements are of course optional. As you can see here, I left them empty. But if you do assign a template here, these, requ these requirements are going to be checked on your uh, player. Here we have the actions part, which obviously is the most important one because this is where you define what will happen when you actually uh, match all the requirements, when you complete the interaction time and so on, right? So yeah, this is the list of actions that will be triggered. You can have as many actions as you want. And here you have a maximum action count. So in this case, we have four actions, but only one can be triggered. And here you can see that they all have their own chance of being triggered. So you could have, for example, a buff, uh, you could have a small chance to get some very rare loot extra, and you could have also 10 different buffs, but only one could be picked out of 10, right? Or we could have four action and maximum actions at four, and we will be able to get them all if um, they all got picked by that chance, right? So yeah, again, full freedom on what you can do. And let's take a look at the uh, type of actions that this interactable object can have. So we have effects. So this is very straightforward. You're basically going to um, trigger an effect. If I take a look at one of the traps here, you can see that um, here, and we look at the actions. Um, not sure why this is two. We have only one effect. I mean, one action anyway, but it doesn't matter. And here you can see that it's of type effect and it's dealing trap damage. So when we, we um, collide with it, we're going to be taking uh, damage from the trap effect. The next effect type is quest. Here you can see that uh, it lets you propose a quest. So for example, I could interact with some kind of um, object. You could even make it look like an NPC technically uh, if you wanted to and interact with um, or rather, you know, and get a quest from it. But I mean, NPCs can obviously be quest giver. So there is not really a need. This is more like maybe a hidden object, you know, under a tree or something, maybe a book, a scroll on the ground. You can easily get points. So this would be talent points and things like that. Give character experience, give skill experience, um, complete a task. So you could have a quest, for example, that uh, requests you to go at the top of the mountain or something. And at the top, you have an object that you can interact with and it will complete the, the, the quest for you. And you can now go down and um, turn in your quest. You can save your character. In the case that you don't want a uh, character data to be saved automatically, you could go under settings, general, saving and turn off auto save. And in this case, you could have your character manually save his character when he's interacting with a shrine, for example, or anything. Or you could even make it a trigger. Remember that earlier we saw how trigger works. This could be an invisible collider. This could be anything, right? It could also be a resource node. In this case, you can create them under world resources. I don't have one created here, but uh, this can be unlocked by talent trees. Uh, they have their own loot table, distance, gather time. They have their own skill. So let's say this would be a copper node. We could level up our mining skill uh, by, you know, gathering this node. We could get some experience and we could require a specific skill level and so on. It could be a chest. So this is uh, what the bucket is anyway. As you can see here, we have a 100% chance to uh, get this loot table, in this case water. But you could have uh, multiple chests, for example, multiple chest action and one be very rare, right? Like 10% or something like that. And this is probably the biggest one and the one you're going to have the most fun with, the game action one. That's actually uh, the one used by the thing that set the time of the, um, of the day. And for this, I'm also going to go in the editor under templates and game actions. As you can see, they look a bit similar to requirements, but they are very different in what they do. We can add as many as we want. And again, just like requirements, they have a massive list of available options. And again, just like requirement, when you select an option, you have multiple options within one. 
So if we select ability, we can trigger it, rank it up, rank it down, reset the cooldown, start cooldown, and this goes for all of those. So for example, when we have a quest here, we can propose, abandon, complete, reset quest, and so on. We have dialogues, we could start a dialogue and a dialogue. We could even instantly kill. So this could be pretty useful if you wanted to um, set up some kind of world boundary. If for whatever reason your player manage to go under the ground or something like this, you could have a big collider under your map and instantly trigger death. And then it's going to be forced to respawn. Um, and as you could see, uh, the one I showed you earlier, we can very easily set some of the time values. So we can set the year, month, and so on. But in this case, I just set the hour. Um, but yeah, we could also set the time scale and set the global speed and so on. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Let me actually um, do something here. Set time scale. Uh, maybe, well, actually, let me just add a new one. Time. Set time scale to 0.5 save here and when we go back to night let's uh, put it back to one time scale one and let's try this now if we go back in game and go to this um two it should slow the game you see that now we are in slow motion and when i go back to night it should go back to normal so yeah that's for you right here an example of what game actions are used for but again uh, this was just one option out of hundreds if not thousands so yeah, let's go back to our buckets and do some um, more explanation on, on what else you can do. The last option is what I said before, it's uh, Unity Events. And this again is big, right? Because you can trigger anything. So as you see, um, we could trigger the, uh, I mean, we can disable the rock very easily, but you can trigger anything you want. Let's say that, um, you wanted to, I don't know, disable anything else or trigger some custom code from you. You could trigger a cutscene like this. You could trigger all kind of things. So um, yeah, and you can of course have as many Unity events as you want. This is just a normal Unity event inspector, right? So yeah, you can just do um, whatever you want in there. Now we can have visual effect here. So um, these are things that could be played. So mo mainly particles and things like this. So as you interact with something, you could play a particle. And you can see that those can be triggered either on the interactable object or the user, in this case, the player, right? And here you have a lot of options, like where do they spawn? Do we attach it to the uh, object or the user, the scale, the duration, the delay? And these are using the uh, visual effect template. So here you see that you have a lot of options as well. We can trigger some animations. Let's look at the epic chest. Here you can see that it has one here and the animation is played on the object. If you do want to play an animation on the object itself, make sure to drag and drop the animator here. By default, it's going to be empty. And here we can see when it is completed. So when we are done with the interaction time, we are going to trigger a, uh, an animation template, which in this case is um, open chest. If I go here, template, animation, open chest, you can see that here we have um, the open parameter and so on again. This I'm going to be covering in its own video about animation template. But the cool thing I wanted to point out is um, if we now select the gate, you see that if I go under animation, it is also using the exact same um, open chest template. So the cool thing about templates is to create them once and reuse them. It might be, at first you might be, oh, maybe I want to create it directly here. I get this, but if you do create a template, you can literally just reuse it. It doesn't matter. In this case, a chest and a door is quite different, right? They look different, but they use the same templates, the same functions. Next, we have sounds. So just like visual effect and animations, they could be triggered on the user or on the object. And this can be, of course, again, a sound template, which also comes with a lot of settings, as you can see here. Below this, we have some state settings. So as you could see uh, before, I explained the different states. So here they are. And here we have settings about the cooldown. So after using the water, so let's say, for example, the bucket now has a one second cooldown instead. In this case, I left this empty, so let's just remove that so we don't get um, 
this kind of message here, but if I now trigger or rather interact with it, you can see that really quickly after one second is going to be back. So you can tweak that, you can tweak the interaction time, so how long it is going to take, let's say 10 seconds, and you can see that obviously in this case it's a lot slower and the max distance at which it can be used. This is useful because uh, some of those objects might be big, it might be a huge rock or like something like this, so yeah, you might need to tweak this. And here the appearance part is um, quite important because if you go outside of play, play mode now and we look at this part, you can see that here we have ready, cooldown and consumed. So consumed is unavailable, I should probably change the name actually, but this this is equal to the states and consume is equal to unavailable here. Um, but basically what this lets you do is, um, these are not prefabs by the way, it's very important to understand this is not going to spawn anything. These things have to be in your um, interactable object. As you can see the water is already here, right? But what this will do is when it is ready, this thing is going to be enabled. So whatever you drag and drop here is going to be enabled. And when it is on cooldown, it's going to disable that. It's basically going to disable everything else but the cooldown one. But we have nothing assigned in cooldown, so it's not going to enable anything. It's just going to disable the others, okay? So that's pretty much it when it comes to uh, that. And here if we see the box, you see that the box is set up a bit differently. The bucket has the bucket, you know, renderer on it. The box is actually just an empty game object as a parent and it has a few things here. So here we have the box which is the actual box here and here we have the box damage. So if I disable this one, you can see that the damage version is right here. So we don't have to spawn anything and uh, so when it is ready it shows the box and when it is on cooldown it just disables the box and shows this one. So that's how this works. And lastly, the interactable UI. Uh, this is just controlling the um, UI when you can press the E key. So if we go ahead and uh, change that. Let me see. Bucket, we could change it to um, buckets or rather water to bucket. And now that's it. And we could change like how high this shows, I can see. So this is useful uh, depending on the object. You might want it to be uh, you know, low, high, extra. That's really um, just some extra freedom and options that you have here. This video is starting to be pretty long. It's probably one of the longest, but it's also because um, this is such a massive feature. As you could see, if you made it um, up to now, you probably saw that, yes, the possibilities are endless and it's really fun. I personally think the one that does uh, the biggest effects is um, the one with the time. And the time scale, I actually forgot that we had the slow motion on this still. But yeah, those two are pretty fun, but we can of course have um, many, many other cool things. And in the next video about interactable objects, not sure yet when I'm going to make it, but hopefully as soon as possible, I will show you how we can save those states. So we can open a door, open a chest, and this being um, safe forever, as well as showing you how we can completely disable a specific interactable object and never be able to use it again with this character. All right, thank you for watching. As always, if you have any questions, let me know in the Discord and see you in the next video.